this week on Erotic Awakening, Women in Leather. And who needs anything else? (laughs) Welcome to Erotic Awakening, an exploration of all things erotic. If you are offended by adult topics or prohibited by law, we recommend you stop listening right now. The Erotic Awakening podcast as well as workshops by Dana Donner offered free of charge to our community. (laughs) Because of the expenses involved, we're grateful to those that support us through Patreon and donations. Fantastical people like Leanne. And... Wait, I'm supposed to come up with another adjective. Yes, that's our new thing. Super people like Jeff. That was a great super. Sorry, super. Yes. Oh, no, we absolutely appreciate you guys. So yeah, Absolutely. Even though we play around with it. So I so, uh, don't have a ton to talk about today, but we have a fantastic interview with uh, Tony Saloni. Saloni. Uh, she recently wrote a book called Women in Leather. Shaping our own identity, and we want to just jump over to that interview. But but I want to do something really quick first. Go oh, such as hi Dan. Oh hi Don. Hi, we Lee. live together. Wait, look at me. We <laughs> live together. I haven't seen you all day. <laughs> yeah, well, you haven't seen me much for the last two days. That's true. So we live in the same house. Well, four days if you think about it. Five days. So Friday, I left your ass here. And I went off solo camping. You did. And then Saturday I came back from solo camping. And since then I've been on work calls. I know. So and, well, I went triking and then motorcycling. Mm-hmm. So you may have left me home, but I kept busy. Yes, you did and, your um, things. Yeah. And then, yeah, but you've had work calls. So I've been leaving you alone. So, but that's okay. I did ask you to come to bed with me last night. Mm-hmm. Well, not... I mean, the fact that we were in bed and where I came is not important right now. <laughs> Other than the fact I didn't have to actually get up afterwards. Um, we do, so we're going to get into this interview really quickly, but first we do have these fantastic new subscribers to the newsletter, and we love talking about that. Like Anna or Anna from New York. Lisa from Kentucky. Daisy Lee from Desert Hot Springs. Poppy mm. Great from Missouri. Thank you. Sheila from Ohio. And Steffi from Virginia. So head over to eroticawakening.com and find the Get Your EA shout out and just sign up for the occasional newsletter. So um, I do try to get that newsletter at least once a month so that people can see the dates that we're doing things for the month. I'm um, getting ready to send out a next one with the Discord information. So now that we have figured out how to put coupon codes on your on our little store, you should stick one on the coo- on the, the, on the uh, newsletter. newsletter. Oh, that's not a bad idea. Okay. Well, there so, you go. Can I borrow your pen, please? Because I will forget. I've been busy, busy today. <gasps> I finished writing a book today. Oh, you did? I finished it. I mean, I still got to gather it and mm-hmm. then add a couple of little snips. But every all the stuff that I was going to put in it, the first draft is done. Wait, what am I writing down? I got excited about a book. <laughs> coupon code for the coupon newsletter. Coupon code. You say coupon. I say coupon. 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 <laughs> I don't know which one it is. It's just like I say poem, and my kids tease me because it's poem. How do you say mayonnaise? Mayonnaise. Okay. We got that the but same. But I say orange, and everybody says I say it wrong. You say orange. Orange. It sounds exactly like what I say. Works orange. For me. Is Orange. It, oh, that's what I say, and the kids tease me. They say it's my East Coast accent. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, I haven't talked to you today. Thank this you. is nice. <laughs> talking to each other and comparing the way we say words. Uh, before we get into the interview, the last thing I'm going to say is somebody did write us. Um, and among the other things that they said, one of the cool things they said was regarding, uh, as far as finding the podcast, they said, I can't thank you enough for the confidence to it has given me to be in who I am. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that is really awesome. And boy, that's 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 the point of it, folks. It is. And you you like to tell people that confidence is sexy. Mm-hmm. So to know that someone's feeling confident now, I just picture them as being all super sexy. Awesome. Their energy is sure. going to be super sexy. All right. So let's get into this interview uh, and find out more about women in leather. Dawn, as you know... Because we ran for a leather contest title mm-hmm. some 10 years ago-ish. 10, 11, yeah. And one of the things that we did was we had to study up on the history of leather. We did. Now, I am no master of the history of leather, but I understand that leather started uh, in, 
exclusively for gay men. That is our understanding. And time goes by, Mm -hmm. and then other people got involved as well. Mm -hmm. And it's really an interesting journey how the doors opened, and it had a lot to do with a lot of things. As I said, I don't know a lot about that. Fortunately for us tonight, Tony Cellini is joining us, who has just recently published a book, Women in Leather, Shaping Our Own Identity. Tony, I'm... I will let the audience know that we've actually already been chatting for about 25 minutes prior to hitting the record button. So it's been great getting to know you so far. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Tell me, did I get the name of your book correctly? I had it as Women in Leather, Shaping Our Own Identity. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is the title. And um, because the history of women in leather is a little bit different than the history of men in leather. So uh, it's well. Let's start. Let's start right there. What is the? How did women get involved in leather to start with? I mean, mm-hmm. I, we understand it as a. It was primarily something for gay men in its beginnings. And we've heard some rumors. So set us straight. <laughs> I, I wish it was that simple. Yeah. Um, so I am a history professor, but I am not a history professor of leather. And uh, uh, my friend Vi Johnson at the Carter Johnson Library tells me that she's been around since the dinosaurs. And when she starts talking about leather, um, there are many different traditions that she starts with in this evolution to to what we know as leather today. So, you know, did it start with gay men? Well, uh, many leather women imitated gay men in their dress and their mannerisms and the protocols of, of motorcycle clubs. And that's one avenue where women in leather actually came from. However, that's only one of many different paths. Most of the women that would identify as pansexual today um, are also leather women. And their traditions really didn't come from from that area, from gay men. Um, You'd have to trace it back through houses of leather, houses of kink. And if you look at old pictures of dominatrixes, from the 19th century, you will find leather in those photos, as you will find, you know, whips and, and crops and, and other uh, items. So, you know, when you look at what leather is, uh, there are many different perspectives on how leather came about. And leather women are a combination of many different cultures, including what we call the queer culture, which is probably the newest to the leather community, because the term queer is generally new. But when you take a look at women in leather, you will see traditions that did not just originate with gay men. Well, let's jump away from women for just a second and come to the understanding of what is the difference between leather and kink. You know, that is a fantastic (laughs) question, and I am going to pull out my old lady glasses here and see if I can find the answer really quick for you. Because that is one of the opening quotes in the book that I wrote. And a San Diego roundtable, women, I asked them that question. In fact, I asked lots of people that question. Um, And in San Diego, they told me that kink is what we do. Leather is what we feel. Kink is how we have sex. Leather is who we are. Kink is what gets us wet. Leather is the journey that we are on. on rather. So it's the difference between an action and a heart. Mm. The way they basically differentiate between kink as an activity, whereas leather is more a lifestyle. I really like that. Yeah, I do too. Because that is I'm one of those sure things. I'm not sure if I can find another quote that fast for you <laughs> with the answer a question. That was very lucky. That was cool. So, And that is a really, like you said, that's a hard, hard question to answer sometimes. You know, we'll have people are like, what is leather? How is it different? And I really like how that encapsulate, encapsulates it all. I need more caffeine. Absolutely. So as we circle back towards my original question, I'm going to continue to be, actually, I'm going to ask you a personal question. How did you find leather? How did you begin this journey? Wow. Wow. Um, I would say, you know, I found kink first. Mm -hmm. And I was kinky for a long time. I didn't know it was called kink 
And I didn't know there were other people who really did kink. So if you said, when, when did you become kinky? I could tell you the exact time and action and date. Um, when did I become part of the leather community? I had to find the community. And it happened about 15 years ago when two women that I met on Alt, I don't know if you remember Alt.com. Sure. Yeah. Alt I, I was looking for sex, okay? Just hopefully kinky sex, but just sex. And it was a couple and they were monogamous and they wanted to meet me and they lived right near me. And I live in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. And they said, you know, come up to this campground where we hang out with these other folks at a campground. Now, I knew how to dress and how to act because I had read all of that stuff on the Internet. I knew it inside and out. And I looked you can't believe it, like the big old dyke here. I looked just like a dominatrix. I had the pump heels and the fishnets and the short leather skirt and a little corset kind of thingy. And um, because that's what I learned what a leather woman looks like. Now, I wasn't trying to be a leather woman. I was just kinky invited to a party. And I meet these two women and they are leather dykes. They are motorcycle leather dykes. Rest was simple. It was just jeans and a leather jacket for the most part. Mm -hmm. But this party and everyone at the campground, it was called the Woods Campground in Pennsylvania, was leather. And I met all of these leather men and they scared the heck out of me. <laughs> they're all in leather with their covers on and they're, they looked huge and they looked mean. And as I walked up and I heard their conversations, they were talking about flowers and cakes and decorating. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, these are just gay men in leather. And they weren't scary after that moment. So I discovered the community by going to a campground. And that's my home community. Uh, the Woods Leather Campground. Uh, it's not a leather campground. Campground that actually has three leather weekends. But many of the guys that are permanent residents there during the season are leather. And from there, I went from an event to an event, and it just blew out of control after I was asked to run for Ms. Woods Leather in mm -hmm. 2010. So, and the rest is probably history at this point, right? But that's how, I, it was like going to a village people kind of party, you know, it was, and there was uh, drinking and play, which I had learned online that you don't do those two things. Mm -hmm. Well, Everyone was drinking. Everyone was pissing on each other. Everyone was um, um, blowjobs all over the place. Blowjobs and pissing and drinking. And, you know, the whips and chains, they weren't there. Mm. Everything that you think of as a dungeon, and I was in their dungeon, wasn't what you would think it would be. It was a great big sex party with beer and a lot of fun. Oh, a lot of fun. You know what? Except for the beer, because I don't do beer, but uh, that's making me miss leather events again. <laughs> so just that feeling, right? That so it was dark. It was dirty. There mm -hmm. was, you know, on my boots at that time. On the first occasion, it was my high heels, right? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it you know it's a mixture of stale beer and cum. <laughs> on cement floors in the dark in a pavilion that had dark kind of um, garbage bags, like plastic garbage bags separating into different rooms of torture, of which there was there was a cross, but nobody was playing, mm -hmm. right? And uh, it was like a maze that you went through. And it was, what an introduction to love. Nice. So somewhere along along your path, you, I guess, decided it was there's some some value in collecting stories of of women in leather. How did that um, come about? Yeah, I you know, by day I am a history professor, and I not only collect stories, I share stories. I've collected stories of veterans from different wars. I've collected stories of feminists in different countries, and. When I ran for Ms. Woods Leather in 2010, um, there was a person named Vi Johnson there from the Carter Johnson Library. And I decided 
that my fundraising would go to the library. And, you know, I wasn't very good at it. Um, I raised a couple hundred dollars and she was very appreciative. But when I ran for Mid-Atlantic Leather Woman in 2012, she's a smart woman. She said, Tony, you can raise money for us. Please do. But I'd really like you to do a history of, you know, since you're a history professor, I'd really like to see you do a history of Mid-Atlantic women and our clubs and the history of our clubs, because this is not written about. Mm-hmm. And um, so I thought, OK, I've, I've seen this modeled sort of. Uh, Jen Victor, when she ran, she was the first Mid-Atlantic leather woman. When she ran for IMSL, she collected stories. It was great. There were about 30, 40, 50 pages. They were stapled together. I thought, I can do a book report for Mama Vi. Why not, right? And I ran into problems immediately. The first time I talked to somebody about a club, and I was in fist at that time, um, females investigating sexual terrain out of Baltimore and Washington. When I asked somebody some questions, they weren't from here. They were from San Diego. And I asked someone else questions, and, and actually was the founder of FIST, you might know, Glenda Ryder. And her history took her from Atlanta. That's where she first heard about some of these things mm-hmm. and brought it back to Baltimore. So I realized very quickly that there was no way to do just a mid-Atlantic story of a few women in an area because we're from other places. We travel other places. We move different places. So I, I had a like a, a come to Jesus meeting with Mama Vi. And I said, Mama Vi, I, I really, I don't think I can do this. And we brainstormed. And she said, you know, if you do a round table and you don't have to interview famous people or people that are well known, you could interview anyone who um, identifies as leather and get them in a circle and talk about their leather life and make sure you have some club stuff in there in your, qu- in your questions. And um, so I did. I went to actually Virginia first. And um, uh, a woman who has now passed, a friend of mine, Lady Lynette, pulled a group of women together outside of uh, Virginia Beach. And we sat in a circle, actually in a restaurant. It was more like a rectangle. And we had a great dinner and a great chat. And everyone loved it. And they said, can we do this again? Well, it was my first leather round table, and I had a lot of other ones scheduled. And that group to this day, not those exact women from 2012, still meet, <laughs> eventually morphed into another group and became Virginia Leather Women United, the first women's leather club in that area. Very so cool. it was, you know, there's a lack of continuity in that story, but at the same time, it was amazing what happened. One leather round table led to another round table who led to invitation outside of the mid-Atlantic into the South, into the Northeast, into the Northwest. And I started traveling to Canada. Next thing you know, it's 40 round tables later. And I realized that I only scratched the surface. So I would schedule interviews with some of the women that came to the round table to go into a little bit more detail of their story. And I've collected these stories for, well, it was five, six years and it was uh, the pandemic hit. And now it's eight years later and the round tables keep happening. I keep getting invited to different places. And I thought there is no ending to this. And this pandemic has given me a chance to actually write it all down and put Mm -hmm. it in a book and say, I'm done collecting these stories. Now I'm going to help train other women to do the same thing. Very so cool. continue, right? So um, it popped into my head. You said you were trying to find people from um, mid-Atlantic, you know, Baltimore area and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, people move. We've got someone here in our area that I go to all the time, or at least used to go to all the time for advice, a leather woman from Baltimore that lives here in Dayton. I mean, people probably don't even, she may not have left a track <laughs> so that you could even track her down. But the, the old pictures of her in parades and stuff in Baltimore are fantastic. So, which reminds me, I should probably do something about interviewing her as she gets older. Mm-hmm. So, and we know Jan's been interviewed. And anyway, so it gets into my 
uh, collecting information. I love to do that. Yeah, and and I every time um, Dawn and I end up talking to somebody from I, obviously. With this podcast, we talk to a lot of kinky people and sexy people and all kinds of people. But when we talk to leather people and they're like, oh, I ran for this contest in 2010 and 2012, um, we start wondering, hey, we haven't run for a contest in a long time. We should, no, 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 no. But, you, you know, it's right. There's, so, and, and for myself, right, I, there is this significant difference between this the leather community and, and kink land, right? And... I'm certainly not going to say one's better than the other. I love events on both sides of that. But there is, and one of the things that, um, one of the things that, you know, when people ask me, what's leather about, right? There's two different times Don and I have been at an event and had our car, and our car broke down due to two different reasons. At the leather event, I mentioned it in passing, and people asked me to, for my keys and they took my car away because we were there presenting and they fixed my car and they brought it back and it just happens, right? That's the kind of community that we see in the, on the leather side of the street. Um, so, and I think it's fantastic that you're collecting these stories and collecting this history. I, I'm, I'm interested in reading it myself because um, obviously I'm a woman, you know? I, I want to know people's stories because the only stories I have are women were only allowed in in the 80s because of AIDS to help take care of the men that were passing, right? So, you know, you've already explained, no, there's a, all other avenues that we came into leather. And, I mean, MAST, when we first moved to Ohio, the Ohio MAST was gay men only. Now, here we are, you know, het. <laughs> we've been in for for a while and yeah just different avenues and it's grown so much and that does lead me to want to ask you this have you ever as a leather woman gotten any pushback or feelings of exclusion or like oh great it's another woman in our space absolutely <laughs> absolutely in fact um the book uh, women in leather Shaping Our Own Identity is a collection of 400 women's voices. Mm. So it's 400 women. There are quotes all throughout. I merely tie their stories together with a narrative. Mm. Um, it is mostly quotes. Um, and I had a similar experience to Lady Lynette. Lady, Lady Lynette um, was in Oklahoma many years ago and had the same experience that I had in Allentown, Pennsylvania at the woods. Now, when I told you that story that I went into the woods and I met gay men, nowhere in that story did I say everyone loved me and embraced me and a kumbaya moment <laughs> occurred. That is not what happened. Um, I was one of three women. And over the next five years, including my title year, uh, there might have been five women and about three to 400 men. Mm. And there was a lot of pushback. And it took a while for folks to get to know me. They knew the two women that I was friends with. And I found myself at that event and some others um, bumped into hard. I mean, a shoulder taking out a shoulder as you walk by, like just being hit. Mm -hmm. I've been burned by cigarettes. My leather's been burned. Lady Lynette tells stories of how um, her poodle skirt was burned. Um, and she learned by those kinds of events not to dress femme. And she said when she dressed uh, more like the gay men, she was more accepted and eventually um, was more accepted in the community. For For myself and my two friends, what we learned is we would play, the dungeon would open at 9 p.m. And we would play between 9 and 10. Mm -hmm. And at 10 o'clock or so, we didn't go back in the dungeon anymore. Um, you have to respect each other's space. And what ended up happening is there were, there are also gay men that are part of that campground that are not leather, that are just campers that drink a lot. And there's free beer. And 
we took a lot of harassment actually from the non-leathermen as well for being in their space because they were coming down to get a blowjob. Mm. And um, what ended up happening is about five or six leather men would actually stand, and these were big guys, in the opening of the section of the dungeon that had the cross, and they stood there as bodyguards and stood there with their arms crossed and didn't let the other gay leather men or drunken gay men come back into our space when we were playing. <laughs> but nice. we had to earn that respect. That didn't just come. Right. Um, <laughs> and it's always funny because the um, cross is on the other side of the bar between these like uh, trash bags, right? So it isn't like there's a wall there. And <laughs> When you would hear the, the floggers hit so hard and uh, um, and you would hear the noise and the owls and the oohs and everything, and you could hear them on the other side. They're like, oh, those are those effing lesbians again killing each other. You know, that <laughs> <laughs> we, we gained the respect. We played hard. We showed up. We helped out. We all served as title holders at different times, raised ma- money for the community. And it took years to get that respect. And now when I show up, nobody knows hardly who I am anymore. Mm-hmm. And the way gets cleared and the dungeon becomes open. But that's because it's been 10 years. Yeah. Of right. Service. Right? right. So, yeah, things were closed off, continue to be closed off. I've had some folks, not some gay men, continue to... Uh, hate my guts and that's okay not everybody has to love everybody that's true and and it's because i'm in spaces that they hold sacred to gay men Mm -hmm. and i'm there too sometimes understood i I got one more question for you if you don't mind i understand you're a history (laughs) professor but i'm going to say the heck with that i'm going to make you do the opposite and be a uh a future Pro- forecaster forecaster very good thank you don <laughs> that's why it's a team podcast here so over the last year or t- and we will say the la- the year before covid the last year before covid we've seen a fair number of events leather events significant regional leather events have fall apart um not happen not because of covid but because of some uh, and I hate Outside to use the influence. I hate to use the word drama, okay? Because it's not people being dramatic; it's people that are standing up and they believe something different. And there's been it feels like it felt like at that time a schism and things are falling apart, and people taking sides and the impact of consent culture versus cancel culture versus just good old let's jump on the bandwagon of the popular people and yell at everybody else there's absolutely uh, the benefit of course there's a big benefit of being able to speak up and speak your mind and stand up for what you stand for but there's a cost to it as well obviously blah 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 part of me says maybe this has been happening forever But it doesn't feel that way. And then COVID gives us this big break. Let's all step back. Nobody's doing anything. Do you feel like leather, where's leather going to be 5, 10, 15 years from now? What is our, what is our future look like? Wow. Well, (laughs) I'm going to give you a four part answer because I am a professor and that's what we do. (laughs) Is this going to be on the quiz? Yes. Okay. Yes, it will be. It will be. Don't Let's see. Notes. I can remember all four parts because, um, as I was telling you before we started, I just fell this week and I have a concussion. So we'll see how my, my brain goes. Well, we'll give you a quiz so, later then. We'll see how that works out. <laughs> okay. So at the end of this book, Women in Leather, okay, the last section talks about women of drummer. Uh, an organization that I, well, it wasn't an organization when I started affiliating with other women who hung around the new renewed drummer movement. And if you ever have an example of a schism and a breakup, oh my God, DNA blew up 
And um, as women of drummer, as being side by side with our gay male brothers, we were in the middle of it, right? Take a look at the last chapter, okay? It's in there. So how did Women a Drummer grow? You know, where did it come from? Why do I have it? Well, I felt that women in leather, while there are different organizations and while they're different clubs and they're different goddamn independents, right, out there that identify as women and identify as leather, I felt that there were very few places left for me to just go and do three things. And I, am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Fuck oh, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> okay. Okay. You made me stumble. So, <laughs> so to do three things, to um, play, to fuck, and to have fun. That's it. That's the reason I got into leather. That's the reason I stay into leather. And that's the reason I'll be in a leather woman next year and next decade. To have fun, to fuck, and to play. The further we get away from that, the more reason to divide hmm. over a multitude of issues. So Woman of Drummer organized for those three reasons, and we stick to those three reasons, and we try our best to stay out of all politics related to any issue whatsoever. And it's hard because as individuals, we all believe very strongly about many different things in the leather community, but leather... Secondly, here's the number two reason. Okay. Leather is a microcosm of a larger society. Mm -hmm. And we have a very divided, fractured, larger society, especially in the United States, that we are representative of this larger dysfunction. So the third point I'd like to make, and I've been asked um, to do workshops on mastery. How do you walk strong in your boots in the middle of dumpster fires? in the middle of organizations um, blowing apart, fighting, schisms, as you said, how do you walk strong in your boots? And this path of mastery is not a path of leather by itself. And that's why I created this second book, which is the fourth point. This is called The Leather Journal. Um, and it's, and the second part is, um, stepping into our power. Hmm. And what I've done with this is I've put together everything I know about self mastery, everything I was mentored to be as a master in leather. And I don't believe there should be a slash self mastery is something that is beneficial to everyone. I am also a professor, but I'm also a curriculum writer. I work for the Army, I work for the National Parks, and I write curriculum for high school kids and college kids. So this journal is 52 weeks, 200 pages of activities. Whoop, I went right to my wife. <laughs> um, and that's, uh, That'll help me later on, right? Um, so it's just prompts and questions for 52 weeks to answer questions. These questions would work at a mast meeting. These questions would work between a master and a slave. It would work between a mentor and a mentee. I believe very strongly that we don't walk strong in our boots and we let everything and anything get in our way of our own personal mastery. We let chaos become part of our life and the chaos out there and we bite at each other and we tear each other down, and we need to become strong as individuals. So I created this 52-week, and you could do it in much less than that, 52-week journal with many prompts in it, quotes from leather women that I asked them, what words of empowerment would you share with someone if they were filling this out? Now, you don't have to be a leather woman, woman identified. You can be a leather person of any gender identification. You don't have to be a master or a slave or any kind of slash to work on this. During this COVID timeout, and the reason I uh, chatted with you about coming on to your podcast is I really want as many people as possible to buy this second book. Now, please buy the first one. But <laughs> this second book, this journal, we have time now like we have never had. Now, I'm very busy myself. And we certainly can fill our time. But folks are telling me they feel overwhelmed. 
they feel bored and they don't feel like they can live more their leather lives. One of the things you said when you asked me this question, which I gave you a long ass answer because I'm a professor, <laughs> um, is while we're not doing leather and we're not doing events, I've never done more leather events. Women a Drummer went right to work last March immediately sponsoring um, Zoom talk every single night. A different coordinator from a different region took it, and we did it all throughout the summer. At that time, different events figured out Zoom. They bought their microphones and their headphones. I already had all this, right? And they started their events. And then we dropped it down to once or twice a week. And then we did an online contest. We didn't say leather stops. Mm -hmm. I'm a leather woman every day, whether I'm in the boardroom, the classroom, or home. And I'm a leather woman before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and after the pandemic. So if you find you have some time, start taking a look at yourself and how you can make yourself stronger. It also asks you about the groups that you belong to. Are they serving you? Are they not serving you? Leave. Leave. Start your own group or make the group better. Mm -hmm. What about these events, these events that blow apart? Are you missing them? Then don't go to them after the pandemic. Create one that works for you. And by damn, come to Woman a Drummer because that is a good time. Where is Woman a Drummer going to be held? We are at Ramblewood Campground, uh, you know, 160 acres, sex positive, clothing yep. optional. We know it. Play party. Play party. Mm -hmm. um, and there aren't leather events held there. So that's why we did it. There are kink events held there and there are camps for kids. But um, we wanted to bring leather there. And it's very different. You don't want your picture taken? Uh, say no. You don't wear a wristband. You um, see something you don't like and you're triggered, turn your head and walk away. This is leather. We fuck, we play, and we have fun. And if you're up for that, come. If you're not, don't. Uh, fantastic. I'm going to change the thing that I normally say at, at the end because I can see the look in Dawn's eye. So instead of a general question, I will change it to be a little more specific. Where can Dawn go to buy both <laughs> your books? Because I could see she is ready to send <laughs> PayPal already. Amazon. Amazon.com. I right. wanted Some... to make it as accessible and easy as possible to buy and to find. Tony um, Cellini, it has been a pleasure to talk to you today. And um, I look forward to reading your books, to well, borrowing Dawn's copies of them, <laughs> um, and finding out more about the uh, Women a Drummer and everything else that you're into. Um, now, I want to I want to say, actually, I think Women a Drummer actually had a party at the space before the pandemic. So don't you have regional parties as well? We do. And we, we have had been one in Columbus, in Ohio. Ohio. Yeah. Columbus, yeah. Ohio. That was our, yeah. our place. I went Beth to that party. Coordinator. You might know Beth. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I have been to a Women a Drummer party and it was phenomenal. Fantastic. <laughs> Tony, a pleasure to talk to you. We uh, wish you continued success, and ha thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you so much. Thanks.